Okay, so we haven't actually got very much further. We've just kind of formalised and gone over some of the ideas that I talked about in the first couple of videos. Now let's go on again and formalise world lines. So for simplicity, just so I can draw pictures, I'm going to work with a 1 plus 1 dimensional space-time, which is essentially R2, or R1, comma 1, whatever you like. So this is our space-time. As we've seen, it's going to have some kind of space coordinate, which I'm going to call x. It would be x1 if we had more coordinates, but just for simplicity, I'm going to keep calling it x. And then, as we saw, we have a time axis, and as I mentioned, we need to introduce some dimension, dimension for quantity to make sure that we're measuring both of these scales in the same units. So our time coordinate, which we call ct, remember this is just the x0 coordinate, but it comes with this c kind of built in. So this is one observer's view of our space-time. It's an observer who sits at the origin of this coordinate system and they view the space-time from this point and they're stationary at this point. Okay, so the observer, which kind of this reference frame represents just sits at the origin of this reference frame and they're stationary in this reference frame. So how do we formalise the world lines which are going to be followed by other particles in this space-time? So for example we might have some observer that starts at some time t naught there some position x naught and then they might follow some trajectory that might look something like this. Now remember we want to indicate the direction that this world line is kind of being traversed in, the, the flow of time essentially. And now this world line essentially represents an observer that starts here on the x-axis at some time t naught and then move in this direction as time progresses, they're moving backwards along the x-axis and then at t equals naught they've got to this point and then as time continues to flow onwards they start moving back again in this direction and they're eventually at some time later going to be further along in that direction. Okay, so how do we formalise this now? Well essentially this world line is just a curve, it's just a curve through R2, so we can come up with some kind of parametric representation for that curve by essentially specifying a function of each of the coordinates that depends on some parameter. So that's what I'm going to introduce now. I'm going to introduce now a completely new and arbitrary parameter called lambda. I'm calling it lambda, not tau. I called it tau in the first episode, but I want to make it Completely clear, this is just an arbitrary parameter that doesn't have anything to do with time right now. So this, we're going to use lambda, it's essentially going to be an element in a real space. And now, sometimes you'll see this referred to as an affine parameter, which essentially means that the parameter values can be taken to lie within the entire real line. Essentially we can take lambda to be from minus infinity all the way up to plus infinity. So now what the world line is, it's going to be a parameterized function, which is essentially just a map. I'm going to give it an index. Now don't let yourself get confused with the coordinates. This kind of is representing our coordinates because it's giving a map value for each one of our coordinates, but it's, it's the world line. So it's a map from this parameter into our space time. So what this does is it takes our parameter value and then it maps that parameter value to a specific point in space-time. So we take our parameter lambda, let me just kind of sketch this. I'm just drawing another real line separate. This is our lambda parameter line. We essentially just do the exact same thing we would in classical mechanics. We take points on this line, so say lambda naught, and then we 
realize, okay, well, we're going to have some x map that maps to the x coordinate and then some t map that maps to the time coordinate of this point. So all the as lambda varies across this line, our map just essentially traces out this world line. So this looks exactly like classical mechanics. We just come up with a parametric representation of our trajectory. But now we just need to remember that this trajectory, well, it's not a trajectory through space. It's actually a trajectory through space time. OK, well, what does this lambda actually represent? Well, at the moment, it's just an arbitrary parameter. We're going to see by making a kind of specific choice of what this parameter is going to be, we uh, can realize that we can use essentially the time that this particle measures itself. So this particle, as it moves, it's going to, well, essentially, this particle is its own reference frame. It's going to be viewing itself as being stationary in its own reference frame. And essentially, if you sit at the coordinate, or if you sit at the origin of your own reference frame, you just essentially follow this world line up the time axis. And so whatever time coordinate that you're measuring in your own reference frame, that's going to be your, what's known as your proper time. And we're going to see that this time that an observer measures in their own reference frame is going to be what we use as our lambda parameter. Okay, so that's world lines. We've seen this in the first video, and this is just how we formally write them down as parameterized functions. So now that we have this world line, we can start to talk about quantities, which we might be itching to define, stuff like velocities. So we've got a trajectory or a curve. We can now start talking about stuff like derivatives. So we might think, okay, well, we can just define the velocity of this particle by just taking the derivative vector to this curve. This would be the parameter derivative in the direction of increasing parameter along the curve. So is this its velocity? Well, it depends who you are. If you're the particle, then yes, this does kind of represent its velocity. But if you're the observer that sits here, you would disagree and you would say, well, no, the velocity of this particle at least at this point, it's going to be in this direction because velocity points in a space direction. It's how fast you're moving through space. This is a one-dimensional space. The velocity can either only ever point in sort of the plus or minus space direction. But now what we need to realize is that there are actually now two notions of velocity which we can introduce. There's the notion of coordinate velocity. So coordinate velocity, as the name suggests, is essentially the velocity that you're moving through a particular coordinate system. So the coordinate velocity is what this observer at the origin is going to measure as being essentially just how fast they see you moving through space-time. And now mathematically this is going to be essentially going to be given by the coordinate derivatives. The derivative of dx with respect to this x0 coordinate, so I'm going to just write that as x0 for now, we could equally have written this as 1 over c dx by dt, because remember x0 is just ct, this is the coordinate velocity. Now this is going to be a vector quantity, and if we had more than one space dimension, say we had x indexed by some other index i, where now we use the convention that if we introduce a Latin index, so letters like a, b, c, i, j, k, they're only referring to space dimensions. So this index i essentially runs from 1 up to the dimension of your space time. And so this coordinate velocity is 
going to be a vector which is going to kind of be one dimension less than your full space-time dimension, and it is truly the velocity from classical mechanics, how fast you're moving through space as measured by some coordinate system. So hopefully this is a familiar notion, but as we can see from this picture, it's calculated in a completely, or it's going to be calculated in a completely different way to how we would expect. It's not the parameter derivative to this curve, it's some kind of other derivative because it's being measured by, in essence, it's using this different t parameter. Now, what happens if we actually consider the parameter derivative now? We can just look at this curve and we can consider its derivative with respect to this lambda parameter. And now that's going to give us something which is known as the 4 velocity. The name 4 just stems from the fact that we always work in a, a 1 plus 3 dimensional space time. You could just call it the, the relativistic velocity or just the velocity. So this 4 velocity is now going to be given by the derivative of the world line functions with respect to this new parameter that we've introduced. And now I'm going to give this the name u, which is what it's commonly referred to as. So this 4 velocity is going to have as many components as the dimensionality of the space-time, whereas the coordinate velocity is going to have one less component because it's essentially only a velocity in the space directions. This is a full velocity. It includes a portion in the time direction, and we're going to explore a lot more about what each of these full velocity components represent in upcoming videos. But for now, let's just briefly see what some of them are going to look like. So let's consider the x naught. So this is going to be our kind of time coordinate taking the derivative with respect to the parameter. So this quantity which I've written here, this dt by d lambda, is going to become an extremely useful quantity for us. It's going to be known as the Lorentz factor usually given the symbol gamma when we realize that this property this parameter is known as the proper time so this quantity this lorentz factor is essentially or well, it's measuring how much the time coordinate is essentially varying as we move along this curve so it's a kind of if you like it's a measure of how much the coordinate time is changing as um, the parameter is also changing. So don't worry if um, this doesn't make too much sense right now, it's going to make a lot more sense when we start talking about um, coordinate transformations between reference frames, and we're going to see we could consider moving from this stationary observer's reference frame, transforming to this moving observer's reference frame, and then we can measure how are the coordinate times different that are measured by these two frames. And this parameter gamma is going to be extremely useful when we perform this transformation. But for now I just want to kind of make you aware. Full velocity is essentially a parameter derivative with respect to, or it's the derivative of our world line with respect to its parameter. So it kind of feels more like the velocity which we would have used in classical mechanics where you just have some trajectory and then you just consider the derivative. This notion of velocity is a coordinate velocity because essentially the parameter in classical mechanics is time and we're just dealing with space coordinates. But as we move to special relativity, coordinate velocity becomes something which is going to depend on essentially the coordinates that you're using. So other observers using different coordinates, they're going to measure a completely different coordinate velocity. Okay, so that was the time component of the full velocity. Let's just really quickly look at the space component. It's going to be dx by d lambda. This doesn't really look too useful by itself, 
but we can realize that by kind of surreptitiously using the chain rule now, we can rewrite this in terms of coordinate velocity. So essentially we can write that the four velocity space component is simply given by the coordinate velocity, and then we use a chain rule. Just use the chain rule there to rewrite the four velocity component in terms of the now the coordinate velocity. And then the first component, which I said was that parameter gamma. So don't worry if I'm kind of, I'm just briefly introducing these, I'm going to talk about them much more in the next video. But for now we should kind of realize that full velocity, this first component of it kind of appears in the second half of the, the full velocity. So the coordinate velocity is somehow dependent on this first parameter, which I call gamma, or the Lorentz factor. So we can see much more how this affects things like velocities and transformation law, uh, velocity transformations, and all of the relativistic physical effects are going to come out of the fact that essentially these two observers are measuring different velocities. Okay, so in summary then, we've seen that space-time as a manifold we can represent using a reference frame, which is just the coordinates on the manifold, and now we can start to talk about entities or observers which live inside this reference frame, and their trajectories through space-time are known as their world lines. Essentially this is a curve which traces out the history of the particle as it moves through space-time. And now since this is just a curve in R2, we can do differential geometry that we love to do on this curve, take its derivatives. Well, we can now realise that there are several notions of derivative that we could consider we can consider how much is this, um, yeah, so we can look at two notions of velocity now. We can look at the coordinate velocity, which is how, essentially how fast this observer is moving simply now just through the spatial coordinates using the t coordinate as the derivative argument. This is the velocity that we're kind of familiar with from classical mechanics. But now we also led to discover a new notion of velocity, which is the parameter velocity, or the four velocity, which is given by this tangent vector to the world line. And we've seen how this four velocity has four components, and the components are kind of very connected by this gamma parameter, which we're going to explore more in future videos.